Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero conversation. I'm excited to have with me Mr. Joe Sullivan, who is the co-founder of Gorilla 76. So how you doing, Joe? I'm doing well. I'm excited to have you on here, my friend. Looking so much forward to hearing your story. And we, we love these hero conversations because we just get a little bit of insight, you know, to, to everybody's journey. So maybe get us get us started with a little bit about your journey to Gorilla 76. Sure. Well, you know, my agency, we we founded it, uh, you know, the seven, six in Gorilla 76 comes from seventh month of 2006. Um, okay. Cause that was going to be a question. So well, there you go. We'll knock, there knock you go. That, that one out at the same time, I guess. And, and so I, I say that because we, we founded the agency yeah, back in 2006, my business partner, John and I, um, you know, we, we met as we were both kind of in, in college studying marketing. I was uh, at Washington University in St. Louis, and he was at Mizzou, which is you know two hours down the road from St. Louis. And uh, we met as interns at um, a, a big agency in St. Louis uh, after our junior years of college, and and just kind of became friends. And we started working together to put our portfolios together. We were trying to get into into you know marketing or advertising, and um, and we started just kind of doing a little freelance work on the side as we found our first jobs at different agencies. And at one point we said, well, why, why don't we try to get some, you know, get some real clients here as, as opposed to, you know, just kind of doing a little design work for the barbershop down the street or, or whatever. And so we, we started writing a business plan and kind of had aspirations of starting an agency at some point. And then it kind of just happened. We, you know, we, we had an, an intro to a, a kind of a small construction firm in the St. Louis area that also had, you know, under their umbrella, a home builder and a, a real estate development company. And, and they just threw a huge body of work at us and said, all right, we want you guys to do this. And we kind of looked at each other and were like, all right, we could quit our jobs right now. Like we could quit our jobs and probably survive for three or four months. And in the meantime, we can build up this business and you know, try to scale up this freelance work we're doing and see if we can make it. And, you know, 15 years later, here we are as a 20 person agency. So obviously a lot's, a lot's happened between then and now, but, um, but you know, we got our start by sort of taking checks from whoever'd write one, and I think that that first big client was significant though because it was kind of our foray into the industrial sector. And one construction company job led to another construction company job, which led us to sort of start positioning ourselves as working with what we at the time called blue collar brands or people who made stuff with right, their hands. Right. And then you know, then we landed a manufacturer and realized like, wow, like the manufacturing sector is. 20 years behind on the marketing front. And there's a lot of opportunity here. And we like working with, you know, these types of companies. Um, and so we, it was probably 10 years ago where we just kind of went all in and said, let's just be an industrial marketing agency agency. These are, these are our best customers. We like doing this work. We figured out how to, how to, you know, have impact on their business and everything kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. So you kind of niched down at that point. We did. Yeah. It's been probably about a decade now since we've We've niched into working with with midsize B two B manufacturers and uh, have never looked back and have no regrets. Man, that is so awesome! So, what, did you always have an entrepreneur type mindset, or did you, did you know that would be your path? Yeah, you know, I, I it's I wanted it to be my path, and I don't know if okay. I if I if I knew you know in my early years how feasible it actually was. But um, I, if you asked me what back when I was in college what I wanted to do for a living, I would have told you I wanted to own a graphic design firm. You know, my my background okay. was art. Like growing up, I was like the art kid, and um, and you know, that was kind of my my superpower. And um, you know, I wanted to figure out how could I bring that into my career and actually you know make a living. Um, applying that talent. And so graphic design was kind of my path into marketing. And um, well, well, physically using my hands to, to, you know, design things is, is long in my past at this point. It's sort of the thing that got me to where I am and a part of what our agency does now too. So that's great. So you guys are located where at now? We're in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, we, you know, it's interesting. Pre-pandemic, uh, there were about 15 of us all here in St. Louis. Okay. You know, fast, fast forward two years, we've grown to about 20 people. And I think we're 13 in St. Louis and seven in other parts of the U.S. So we've kind of nice. realized, well, why, why are we, you know, if our people are 20 minutes away working from home, what's the difference between that and them being, you know, 15 hour drive away from, from here? And we're all communicating right. the same way now. So we've kind of so it's helped us open up our talent pool and 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 you know kind of embrace this remote work style which works and when you're in an in, in information business like we are right no doubt 
Now, I am curious. So you niched down to manufacturing. You know, love that. Uh, Eco asked why we serve that manufacturing sector for sure. You know, so you work with them day in and day out. So I'm curious, where do you see it as some of the biggest challenges those manufacturers are having right now? Yeah, I mean, the two biggest challenges that manufacturers that I talk to are having, uh, and I learned this from the prospects we talk to, from our existing clients, and from all the people I talk to on on the podcast that I host, which is you know where I talk to manufacturing leaders, it's pretty clear that it's it's one labor and two supply chain, um, and that probably comes as no surprise to anybody listening right now. But in some ways, I think it's had a, a negative impact on my own business as a company that is helping manufacturers, um, you know, having helping the revenue side of their business, right? Because a lot of them are constrained by those two things. It's you've got companies that um, you know they they could go out and tap into market share they haven't won, but they wouldn't be able to source the materials to fulfill the orders and get you know and meet on time delivery, and they don't they don't have enough people to put on the machines to get the work done, and so those two things are um, again probably no surprise to our, to our listeners, but are, are the biggest issues we we've, we've been seeing um, over the last couple of years. Yeah. And I mean, that labor, we, we've been hearing that from all the people we've been talking to, too. I mean, supply chain, for sure, as a distributor, we feel that ourselves directly. Uh, but from the labor, that workforce attrition and skills gap, that's two factors of the labor. I'm, I'm not sure. Do they pretty, do they align pretty well to what you're seeing? Yeah, 100%. And you know, we I talked to a lot of people in um, who are in, you know, kind of the robotics uh, corner of manufacturing. And um, so I get a lot of insights from their perspective too. And, right. and it's, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's what's going on here. It's, it's no, you know, you see it in the news finally over the last, you know, six months or so, you're seeing more and more of that in the news as, and not just in manufacturing, but, you know, across all kinds of sectors from yeah. know, people working in, in retail and fast food and, and things nobody can find work you walk into walgreens and you know it's like you can't find somebody to uh to, to even help you so it's um i, I think it's it's in, in some ways sort of exacerbated in in manufacturing though um from what i see so i mean is it a perception deal with manufacturing i mean i'm trying to understand why mm -hmm. these manufacturers are having such a hard time getting that labor you know in there where in the past i mean you know, I've grown up in, in factory towns and, and that was, you know, that was, that was celebrated. I mean, those factories were full of people and it was, you know, those jobs were, were fought for. So just curious on why you think this shift. Yeah. It's a topic I dig into a lot because, you know, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm not a, I didn't come from an engineering background or a machining background or, or something like that. I'm, I'm a marketing guy who's, who's, you know, built my career in, in the manufacturing sector. Um, and so I'm always investigating that problem to better, better understand and and from all you know, all the people I talk to, um, a lot of it is true. What you just said, it's it's this perception of manufacturing as being dirty, dark, dangerous. Those are the yeah. you know, the three Ds three you hear Ds. about all all the time, right? And uh, and a lot of the problems I think stem not only from the the young people entering the workforce or who are maybe hesitant to enter the workforce. A lot of it's not just them, but it's their parents. It's the generation that's. You know, I'm I'm approaching 40 here, and it's the people probably in their 40s who have kids going, in, who are you know, high school age, and and they would never, they, they they don't want their kids working in factories. They 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 think of it as as you know, sort of a, a second tier job. And I think you know, I, I look at all the the unbelievable innovations that are happening with robots and with you know, industry four point uh, or industry 4.0 technology and AI and uh, machine learning, like there's so much cool stuff happening in manufacturing. It's becoming a technology driven sector in a lot of ways, which is something that is frankly, when, when, when young people see it, it's super appealing. It's, it's, it's yeah. incredibly interesting. And while those dirty, dark, dangerous factory type of jobs, well, there's plenty of it still out there. There's a, a lot of that has changed in a lot of places too. I walk into the facilities of some of our clients and these places are spotless and they're bright and there are people who are proud of, of their jobs and there are people who are, you know, working side by side with cobots and they're, you know, people moving off of, you know, jobs where they're they're working on production lines and learning how to um, you know, manage software and things. And so there's there's just it's it's 
th- I think that's the first thing that has to change. And I know there are a lot of really great advocates out there who are trying to shift that perception, but we yeah. got to change the perception of what manufacturing is in the first place. No doubt. No doubt. So important. So important. But there are a lot of good advocates out there. I think you're one of them. You know, you're out there, you know, really promoting the things that are changing 4.0, you know, smart manufacturing, you know, machine learning, all those areas you just talked about. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm curious now too, you mentioned earlier, you know, you have, you have a podcast, Mm -hmm. manufacturing, manufacturing executive podcast. So maybe share with our listeners, what's, what's your, the mission of that show? Yeah. So the manufacturing executive is, you know, it's, targeting and you know meant to put the spotlight on the people who the show's named after manufacturing executives right it's a it's a show for manufacturing leaders um you know probably 50 to 75 percent of the people i interview on that show are exactly that they're ceos and presidents or you know people in leadership roles inside of manufacturing organizations and i bring them on to to talk about you know about these these issues the the labor issues the you know supply chain issues the you know technology that's entering the manufacturing sector also just the you know leadership challenges and success stories and and the things that have helped them get to where they are and the the um you know the things that they see on the horizon and so it's really meant to be a resource to other manufacturing leaders so they can learn from their peers and the other thing i do is i bring in people with different areas of specialty like uh you know marketing experts and sales experts um private equity firm partners people who uh, have a role inside of manufacturing organizations in their careers, and they can lend their expertise to leaders kind of with outside perspectives as well. Very cool. Very cool. So I'm curious now you've been doing, how long have you been doing that show? Yeah. Well, let's see here. Um, I, I have, it, I started the show in June of 2020. So, um, you know, our, or the time we're recording this right now, at least it's, it's February. So we're coming up on, uh, Two years in in June, so I think I'm okay. recording episode 93 today. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah. So, do you, is it a weekly type drop? Yep every every Tuesday morning, um, an episode comes out, and I'm proud to say that we have yeah I think 87 87 episodes are live, and I haven't missed a week since I started. So, hoping to keep that streak going. That consistency is what it's yeah. all about for sure. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, how about that show? Has how has that helped Gorilla 76? Yeah, I man, if you asked me that question a year ago when I was, you know, almost a year in, I would have said, you know, I'm not quite sure yet. And now I can tell you because of the consistency, um, it's had a, a massive impact. Uh, you know, one, I think first and foremost, it's just the relationships it's helped me to build inside of the manufacturing sector. And that might sound a little fluffy, but it's not. Um, you know, people who I would would never have connected with or talked to, you know, manufacturing leaders, in, influential people in manufacturing. Um, it's just opened the door to talking to to a lot of these people. It has been largely impactful on our own marketing and business development front. Right. I mean, I, I have no problem saying that I've generated multiple six figures of revenue directly attributable to my podcast just because of the, you know the the doors it's open and people I've been introduced to um you know outside of that I, I I think it's I would also say it's been the best market research I've ever done you know if you think about it I'm talking to the exact people I'm trying to reach I'm putting the spotlight on them but in the process of interviewing a, a CEO of a successful manufacturing company about the things that they're seeing going on and the challenges they're having, having the opportunity to talk to them for 30 minutes and then do it again the next week with somebody else and again and again and again and again. I mean, I, when, how else do you get the opportunity to talk to your exact audience and hear what's in their brain and, and just have that two-way dialogue? It's just been incredible market research and insight into, into what's going on with the people I'm, I'm trying to reach. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hats off to you. I'm so glad to hear that success that you've had. I am curious with that many guests, I think you said you're recording 93 a day. So mm-hmm. what's been your best interview or, or your, your, mm. your your favorite? Just just curious. Yeah. Oh, man, it's tough to pick a favorite. But you know, I will say as I, I interviewed um, the author, Mike Weinberg, um, about a year ago, probably at this point. Uh, he's He's the author of a, a number of books, but the one that really has kind of been influential to me in, in my career is a book called New Sales Simplified. And it's a sales book, okay. um, but it's chapter eight of that book. I, I recommend everybody picks it up is a, probably the best platform I've ever seen for articulating who you help as a company and how you create value for those people. 
Um, and Mike's one of these guys who, you know, he's, he's, I think that book's like the third best selling sales book of all time on Amazon. And like, you know, he's, he's kind of a big name guy. So it was kind of like a, I, I'm interviewing one of my heroes here in, yeah, in, yeah. in this world. But man, the way he was able to take his expertise as a, a sales guy and communicator and apply that to manufacturers was just, uh, it was beautiful. And it was like the, the amount of, of visibility that episode got and, the comments that the little you know snippets I pulled out got on LinkedIn, and um, it was just it was it was really impactful for me, and it was also just really cool to to talk to you know one of these guys who's a, you know kind of a, a micro celebrity, right? Yeah, no kidding, man. That's yeah. great. Well, I tell you what, we'll, we'll make sure we put that interview in the show notes yeah. too because that yeah. sounds like something that uh, Eco Asy Nation may want to check out. Yeah, it's it was a really great conversation. Very cool. Very cool. Now, I, I love in these hero episodes, Joe, just mm -hmm. to get advice. So, you know, yeah. if you somebody's thinking about pursuing manufacturing, you've talked to so many executives in the manufacturing. What would be some advice you give them to, about coming into this sector? Yeah. You know, I think it's, um, it's just give it a fair look, like get inside, you know, I'd love, I would love for more people who are thinking about manufacturing and the parents of say the, you know, younger generation thinking about it to, uh, be able to get inside some, you know, some of these more advanced facilities and and see because you know, a lot of people are opening their doors to, to people they want them to come in and see, you know, robots in action and like the impact of of uh, you know a connected factory and and the you know, all the technology that goes into it and just see how different it is than what they probably think it is or maybe what it was a generation ago because uh, I think just seeing that for a half hour would just completely change people's mindset and, and um, make it, you know, make you a lot more open to, to the possibilities. And I guess the other thing related to that too is I, I hear this just from so many people I talk to, like there are really great jobs in manufacturing. Um, you know, th this labor shortage going on right now and, and the, you know, so the, the baby boomer generation exiting the workforce and we hear plenty about that, but there are really great jobs to be filled Um in manufacturing and you know and they sh they shouldn't be looked at as as jobs for the people who who you know well i don't know if college is for me i'm, I'm i don't know if i you know if that path is if i'm smart enough or something like it's it's right the perception that these are like second rate jobs needs to change because they're not there's really there's really great work to be done out there and, and really exciting and interesting work too absolutely I second that all the way my friend all the yeah. way yeah <laughs> So I'm curious, last question about your career, and then we're going to jump off the path and have some fun with you outside cool. of work. So, but when, when you're at work and you mm -hmm. get home and you've, and you've just crushed it that day, you know, you, you're mm -hmm. feeling a sense of joy. What, what did you do that day? What brings you that happiness and mm -hmm. fulfillment? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think when it's, you know, maybe a few things, I, I think, you know, I, I love when I have, some time during my day to do something that is actually impactful for my business or a client as a business owner. Like I, there's so many hats I need to wear from managing people to putting out client fires when they emerge to, right. you know, just answering emails and, and things. And I think some of the most fulfilling days for me are when I can carve three hours and I can dial in on, you know, a project that I know is, is impactful or I can spend, you know, We'll do workshops with our clients where we can, you know, have these these conversations like this face to face and and dive into what's going on in their world and uh, and understand their business better. And I come out of that feeling like, okay, I I understand this client's issues w way better, and I know what they need to do to get from point A to point B. Um, those those chunks of time can be hard to come by, I think. And, yeah. And so when I can when I can leave my day feeling like I didn't just check off a bunch of small tasks, but I, I had time to do something meaningful. I think those right. are probably my most fulfilling days. I love it. I love it. All right, Joe. Well, let's, let's talk about you outside of Gorilla 76. Okay. Mm -hmm. So hobbies, man, what do you enjoy doing for fun? Yeah. Well, I, I feel like the last seven years, it's mostly just been, um, you know, main or sort of managing the chaos in, in my own home with, with three kiddos. I got a seven year old, five year old and, uh, and, a you know, six month old now. And so, um, you know, honestly, most of my time when, when I've got free time is, is spent just kind of, you know, hanging out with them playing, um, again, managing chaos, but, yeah, yeah. um, you know, at least some of my hobbies, like I, you know, I, I don't do it. I'll do a whole lot of it anymore, but 
you know, I mentioned earlier, I, I was like an art kid growing up and, and, um, you know, I've, I'd love to, to be able to open up some, some projects again, drawing, painting, things like that. Um, uh, I have always been a ping pong enthusiast. I, I need really? that back in my life. Um, which sounds ridiculous and it is, um, but you know, kind of just one of those fun things that you wouldn't, wouldn't know about me. <laughs> That's cool, man. That's very cool. Yeah. So your, your, your family, you mentioned that yeah. we love talking about family here. So, uh, was it a, you said nine year old and then all the way down to a six month old, seven, five and six months, seven, yep. five and six months. Okay. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So I have a five month myself, right? So I'm, yeah, I know you do. You, you know, mentioned right there with you, yeah. the, uh, the sleepless nights, man. We're, yep. we're, I'm here with you, brother. We should be, we should be like hanging out at, at night, you know, like trying to do something while we're, we're sitting there wide awake. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, so for yours, are they boys, girls, which, what you got there? Yeah. My daughter, Grace is seven. My son, Jack is five and our, uh, our baby is Charlie boy. Yeah. Okay. I, mm-hmm. I'm all girls, man. All the all way. All girls. So, wow. So yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, haven't had, had that boy. So we'll see. We, we may be trapped one more, but I, you know, my, my, my odds are stacked against me, man. <laughs> how, how many you got? <laughs> three. We had three, 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 three daughters. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yep. Uh, 11, nine and, and five months. So all right. Awesome. So, you got a nice gap there between your, your first and your last one. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Got a little help there with my 11 year old for sure. Yeah, that's good. Sure. Yeah. That's huge. My, my seven year olds, you know, kind of pretends she's helpful, but it's, it's, it's tough to get, you know, more than that's a right. few minutes out of her. So, <laughs> right. That's right. So what, what else about your family? Are you guys all there local in St. Louis? Um, we have, so we're, we're currently a team of 20, 13 of us, I believe if I got the numbers right are in St. Louis and seven are elsewhere in, in the U S. Okay. So, yeah. mm-hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for sharing with us about your family. We love to hear about, about that on eco So maybe now what about podcasts? We know the manufacturing executive is a great podcast mm-hmm. that, that you that you host, but are there any other shows you consume or YouTube channels, books, just looking for things that you enjoy to consume that, you know, listeners may enjoy checking out. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, inside of, of the manufacturing sector, at least, I think my, my favorite podcast is, uh, is Chris Lukey's, uh, manufacturing happy hour. Probably some of you listening are, oh, yeah. are familiar with that. Um, been, I've been on that show myself. Yeah. Yep. I've, I've seen, yep. I think I've seen or listened to, or seen at least seen some clips from, from that episode as, as well. So Chris does an awesome job. Um, you know, just he's he he came from a background in Rockwell Automation. He knows the manufacturing sector well, and and yep. is just a great interviewer. And plus, they you know you drink a beer with him over over the episode, so it makes it makes <laughs> yeah, it you yeah, know lighthearted cool, yeah. and fun. Um, so I love that. Um, outside of manufacturing, kind of in more in my marketing world, you know, my the the the, the guy and company I follow a lot um, is uh, Chris Walker from Refine Labs. He's got a show called um, State of Demand Gen. And it's, it's, uh, you know, if you want to, you want to kind of move into the modern era of marketing, um, follow what he's doing. He serves the, the software, um, industry m- much more so than manufacturing, but, um, you know, it's, it's where, it's where we're all going to be in the manufacturing sector a few years down the road. So if you want to get out ahead of it and, and see what's working on the marketing front right now, um, go, go take a look at that one. So that's and one of my favorite. It's resources. called the, the state of demand gen state of demand gen as in, as in demand generation. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's great. That's great. Any, any books or anything like that you, that you, you know, you go to for personal mm-hmm. or marketing? In general? Yeah. So, um, you know, some of my favorite books, uh, it, one of them, I know Chris, you and I both share is, um, they ask you answer by yeah. Mark, Marcus Sheridan. I think it's the, I think it's probably the best book that on the marketing front that anybody in, in any kind of you know, manufacturing leader could, uh, could pick up if you're kind of newer to marketing. It's really, you know, his, his deal is, is you, if they ask you answer is, is really what it's about. It's what do your customers care about? What are the questions they're trying to get answered? The problems they're trying to solve. If you can be the best resource to them around that and craft all your marketing content around that, as opposed to just talking about yourself, you're going to earn attention and trust and, and open the door to, to the opportunity. That's right. That's right. Yep. And if you and if you get that book, you'll you'll have a famous person that that does a, <laughs> a review at the very first page. So when I opened the they ask you answer, it was it was Joe there. I was like, Joe, my man, you did a review. So that's awesome. 
It's so funny. I, you, you mentioned that to me when we were talking recently. You're like, yeah, you're in that book, right? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm definitely not in that book. And I, and I thought you meant, you know, I was quoted or something. And um, and then you pulled the book open on screen and there my Amazon review was pulled into that book and I didn't even know it. So now it's sitting on the shelf behind me, the new the new version of it, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm on the first page, right? Like yeah, my, yeah. my Amazon review. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, kind of fun. You, you yeah. literally were the first review. I'm like, my man is at the top of the page. That was awesome. So <laughs> yeah, but no, that, that's that's my favorite. You know, I mentioned earlier, um, um, new sales simplified. It's a sales book, but uh, you know, chapter eight of that book, in, in particular, with with Mike Weinberg, is uh, I think if you need to just figure out how to articulate your audience in an audience centric way. Yeah, um, who you are and how you create value for them. Um, I'd, I'd steer you towards that one. Um, so yeah, those are a couple worth okay. worth noting. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure we link those up in the show notes too for listeners cool. to go check those resources out for sure. So, so Joe, we're getting there towards the end of the, of the interview. And what I love mm-hmm. to do is a lightning round just to kind of fire some things, get, get a little bit of insight to, to what you enjoy outside of work. You good? Uh, let's do it. All right. All right. So I always start easy stuff, man. Favorite food? Cheeseburger. All right. Adult beverage to go with it? Um, some kind of IPA. Any IPA. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Very good. So what's your favorite app on your phone? Um, I would say Evernote. Really? Okay. I used to use Evernote a lot. I haven't, haven't, uh, haven't used it in years. I sound a little old school probably saying that Evernote's my favorite app, but, um, it's, I've got like my whole business world, you know, especially with yep. content and things organized inside of that and on my phone and on my computer and everything. It's where I just jot stuff down ideas as I have them. So nice. it's been around forever, but I still love it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, it never forgets, right? That, that's that's, that's right. the deal. Very good. Very good. What, what's on your nightstand? What's on my nightstand? Uh, yeah. A lamp and a clock and a phone charger. <laughs> well, very simple. Very simple. I'm just answering the question, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. How about uh, sports teams? Uh, Green Bay Packers all the way. Well, not this year, but, but, um, yeah, that, I'm a NFL guy for sure. And, and the, the Packers are my team. I, you know, I, I grew up in Milwaukee and, and so my allegiances are admittedly more Wisconsin than they are St. Louis or Missouri, which is where I've spent my adult life. But okay. Yeah. I, I'm glad you clarified. Cause I was, I was, I was expecting you to go Cardinals or something like that, but yeah. Okay. Well, my kids are all Cardinals fans. I'm going to let them be Cardinals fans instead of Brewers fans. But <laughs> NFL is um, we're, we're Packers people. Gotcha. Gotcha. <clears throat> very good. Very good. What's your all time favorite movie? Ooh, all time favorite movie. Um, let's just go with the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yeah, OK. OK. How about uh, TV show? TV show. Um, if I had to pick one. The Office. Oh yeah, man! You can't go wrong there. Cannot nah. go wrong. You just made our our uh, our marketing lady Andy. You just made her smile. So <laughs> I know when she edits this and gets to it, because nobody's ever said the office yet on Eco S Y. All right, so that, nice. So you you check that box, man. So that that's. I figured she, that would be a, a standard answer, but I'm glad I'm the first. It hasn't been. It hasn't been. Now, she and I we throw gifts back and forth all the time with of, <laughs> of the office. So it's just what we do. But yep. how about uh, a guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure. Um, Cereal that's designed for six-year-olds, but I bust open at ten o'clock at night. Whether it's Frosted Flakes or Fruit Loops or Captain Crunch, um, you know, fill in the blank with whatever right. sugary cereal you want. Hey, it's good stuff, right? It's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what's the uh, What's the coolest place you've ever been? Hmm, um, that's a great question. <sighs> I'm gonna say the Greek Isles. Oh, nice, nice. All right, so you, you're taking your, your your wife out on a date. Where are you guys going? Um, we're going to a St. Louis area restaurant called Olive and Oak. Just okay, great classic, you know, fairly modern twists on classic food. Um, great environment, you know, just a few minutes from home, so we can maximize time while somebody's with our kids. And um, yeah, that's that's it. right, that's <laughs> right. Awesome, awesome. All right, last one, Joe. Uh, dogs or cats? Dogs. All right. Yeah. All right. You answered that one right, man. So you passed the test. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, Joe, this has been a lot of fun, my friend, just getting to know you to the hero episode here. So always end up eco ask why with the why. So what would be your personal why? My personal why? Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I just, I, I think the, I've got a lot of passion for what I do with, with marketing and I love 
doing it inside the manufacturing sector, but ultimately, and I mean it when I say it, like I do what I do because I want to give my kids a great life. And, um, you know, I, I think I want to be able to, to, um, do some of the things that my own, you know, parents were able to do for me and, uh, be able to pass that on to, to the next generation. So. Absolutely, buddy. Well, I love it. I love it. So where were the listeners out there? Where should they go to connect with you to learn more about Gorilla 76 things you're doing? Where, where do you want to point them to? Yeah, I'd send them to gorilla76.com. That's gorilla like the animal. Um, I'd, I'd recommend checking out our learning center. We we put a lot of energy and, and time into just creating resources for marketing people in the manufacturing sector and manufacturing leaders. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn, one of many Joe Sullivan's, but um, just look up Joe Sullivan Gorilla 76. And then if you're interested in my podcast, uh, themanufacturingexecutive.com. Absolutely. Highly recommend all those. And for the listeners out there, check out the show notes. We'll have those links there. So Joe, it's been, a, it's been an absolute pleasure. Love getting to know you. Thank you for, for sharing everything on Eco Ask Why. Thanks for having me, Chris. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. 